to our worship service this evening on Good Friday. We will be finishing up our reading of the Passion history this evening. Also, of course, meditating upon the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. The series that I've been preaching on salvation unto us has come. This is, will be the last session on that series in that hymn. So the, those are the major things that are finishing up here. We will have at the end of the service uh, what's called Tenebrae, which is a service of darkness. And uh, while the choir is singing its second anthem, I'm going to be slipping out to turn off the chancel lights. Okay? And uh, we'll, we'll go through that service of darkness together, extinguishing the candles as we remember our, our uh, reproaches. And at the end, I'm going to be carrying out this Christ candle. Okay? When you see me go out with a Christ candle, don't get up and walk away. Wait. Okay? Uh, we have to have the symbol for the closing of the tomb. And then the congregation leaves in silence. Okay? So that's, that's uh, a few notes to, to take about the service this evening. One other thing I will mention is that tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I'm going to be over here in the chapel for a prayer vigil. It'll last maybe about an hour. Uh, the Sunday school doors over here will be unlocked, so if anyone would like to join me, they may come right in. And uh, it's just going to be a time of prayer. And uh, just letting you know that that's, that's what we'll be doing on Holy Saturday for those who would like to attend. So with those announcements made, do we have someone to ring the bell this evening? Let's have the ringing of the bell followed by our opening hymn. God bless your meditation this evening. <laughs>
of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. history tonight drawn from all four of the Holy Gospels and the focus here is on the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ and the preparations that are being made for the tomb and many women were there beholding afar off which followed Jesus from Galilee ministering unto him among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's children the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was in high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight, then took they the body of Jesus, and wound it in linen cloths with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. And the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after, and beheld the sepulchre, and how his body was laid. And they returned, and prepared spices and ointments, and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now the next day, that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so that the last error shall be worse than the first. 
Pilate said unto them, You have a watch. Go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Here ends our passion history.
you, choir. We continue now with our sermon hymn. rise. The text for our message this evening is from the prophet Daniel, the seventh chapter beginning in the thirteenth verse. I saw in the night visions, and behold with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, and glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. This is the word of God. Please be seated. Well, Good Friday brings us face to face with the outcomes of sin and death, as well as our salvation accomplished through the atoning death and sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we have sung over the past six weeks, this hymn, Salvation Unto Us Has Come, lays out these central truths step by step and describes how we as God's people then live in view of these truths, in view of the gospel. 
So the question arises, how is it that this classic hymn, a morning star of the Reformation, how is it that it is not found in our hymnal? How did that happen? In some parts of Europe, this hymn was sung more and more favorably than Luther's most favorite, famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Why did salvation unto us has come get lost? In the 18th and 19th century, about 200 years ago, changes entered into Christian thought and Christian practice. People grew less and less interested in the truths of the faith and became more interested in how those truths made them feel. They got focused on their feelings, their hearts. They wanted a religion of the heart rather than a religion of the head. And if you've ever heard somebody make that kind of distinction about a head religion versus a heart religion, that's where it starts. That's where it comes in. This cultural movement was known as Romanticism. Romanticism. And the popular hymns of this era became romantic hymns rather than hymns that taught the faith. So slowly, teaching hymns, hymns that, that taught doctrine, fell out of favor and did not get included in hymn collections. That's how this happened. Now, pull down your hymnal for a minute and turn with me to the back of the hymnal, page 933. You've never been in this part of the hymnal probably. Page 933, way at the back, you'll find the indexes there. 900, excuse me, 993, 993. At the top of the page, you're going to see on 993, it says index of authors, index of authors. Then look at the left-hand column and follow it down to toward the bottom of the page. You see the L's there, and almost at the very bottom of that column, you see Luther, comma, Martin and a series of numbers behind it. Those are references to the hymns in the hymnal that were written by Pastor Luther. And if you count those up, you're gonna find that there are seven, seven hymns from Pastor Luther in this hymn book. Now, Pastor Luther wrote a lot more hymns <laughs> than these seven. In fact, just hymns of the catechism. There are six hymns from Luther just on the parts of the catechism for teaching the contents of the catechism to people. Luther's hymns, like salvation unto us has come, are designed to teach the Christian faith. That's what they were for in that era of the Reformation. But when Romanticism came in, Teaching or doctrinal hymns went out. Today, folks, things are different again. Today, we need teaching hymns. We need hymns that will teach us the Christian faith. Think about it. You get talking with people and you ask them questions or get into a discussion with them about the doctrine of the church, about the contents of the Bible, and you'll find that many, many people are simply unfamiliar with those basic truths of the faith. We run into this all the time these days. We need those opportunities for teaching. Now, we certainly also need Hymns that speak to the heart, don't we? And we just had the choir beautifully sing, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? That is a hymn that speaks very much to the feelings of the faith. 
and speaks to the heart. We need hymns like that, but we also need hymns that speak to the mind and grant people understanding. To have a balanced Christian life, you need both. Romanticism is not enough. I'll give you a secular example. Have you heard of a little band called the Beatles? Okay. Yeah, the youngest ones don't know what that is anymore, by the way. But most of us in the room here do. The Beatles famously wrote and sang a song called, All You Need Is Love. And it was very shortly after that that the band broke up. Okay? You can't get along on the romantic aspect, the real heart stuff alone. There needs to be something more. And the same is true for the hymns of the church. We need to bring in again some of those teaching hymns to ensure that people are celebrating the doctrinal truths of the faith. Now, I didn't include this in the morning service, but I'll include it here. This does not mean that your pastor wants to do away with your hymnal. Okay, I'm not condemning the red hymnal. It does mean that like Pastor Stolzenberg, I will be bringing in hymns new and old that supplement what we already have in our very fine hymnal. Okay, I want to be clear about that so nobody goes home scratching their heads or, or worried. Okay, <laughs> so hymns new and old, hymns that speak to the heart, hymns that speak to the mind and teach the faith. That's why we've brought back this classic hymn and made it the focus of our Lenten season. And it's a hymn that we'll be coming back to in the future. Since this is our last Lenten service with this hymn, let's look at how our hymn writer ends his work in this hymn. It's it's verse 13 that's printed there in your bulletin. And as you look that over, you're going to see how he focuses on the topic of prayer and praise. Prayer and praise. He's borrowing language from the book of Daniel about the kingdom of God, about the dominion and rule of God, and also from the petitions and the doxology, that closing part of the Lord's prayer as he writes these last two verses. In other words, after learning the content of the faith, the teachings of the faith, one responds with prayer and praise for our God. And this describes the Christian life in action, doesn't it? Set free by Christ to intercede for those in need and to offer a beautiful, sacrifice of worship and praise with our mouths, with our lives, before our God. We respond with prayer and praise. The head instructs and leads the heart to say, verse 13, May glory, Lord, with highest praise for this our God's salvation. The Father, Spirit, Son be raised. See how he works in the doctrine of the Trinity here. Who will bring unto completion the work he hath in us begun, that glory may for him be won. For this his name be hallowed. Be celebrating the reign of God in our lives and thereby in the life of this world. And it's such a contrast, isn't it? As we're observing Good Friday here today, because Good Friday is all about the weakness of our Lord Jesus Christ, that focus on his human nature, how he suffers, how he dies. And the hymn writer, writer reminds us that Jesus is not just an ordinary man. He is God and man in one person come together for us and for our salvation.
truly in Christ, salvation unto us has come through the cross. And as we'll soon celebrate, through that empty tomb on Easter morning, praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. <laughs>
congregation may be seated. Darkness, the Latin word is tenebrae, descends as candles are extinguished during the closing prayers and meditations. In Micah chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, the Lord asks his people how he has offended them and invites them to answer. He likewise reminds them of the many ways he has blessed them. <laughs> The medieval Christians expanded the Lord's question into 12 reproaches about our unfaithfulness and the Father's mercy in sending Jesus to bear our sins. On Good Friday, Lutheran congregations used these reproaches, meditating on the sacrifice of Jesus and praying for God's mercy upon our lives. The setting below includes the singing of Good Friday hymns and responses drawn from Isaiah chapter 53. We begin. O oh my people, what have I done unto thee? Or wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me, because I brought thee forth from the land of Egypt. Thou hast prepared a cross for thy Savior. Holy, holy God, holy, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. unto thee, or wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me, because I led thee through the desert forty years, and fed thee with manna, and brought thee into a land exceeding good. Thou hast prepared a cross for thy Savior. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with against me. What more could I have done for thee that I have not done? I indeed did plant thee, O my vineyard, with exceeding fair fruit, and thou art become very bitter unto me. For vinegar mingled with gall, thou gavest me when thirsty, and hast pierced with a spear the sign of thy Savior. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. done unto thee, or wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. I did scourge Egypt with her firstborn for thy sake. Thou hast scourged me and delivered me up. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows.
people, What have I done unto thee? Or wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. I led thee forth out of Egypt, drowning Pharaoh in the Red Sea, and thou hast delivered me up unto the chief priests. We did yes. see him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. against me. I did open the sea before thee, and thou hast opened my side with a spear. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. unto the judgment hall of Pilate. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. against me. I did feed thee with manna in the desert. Thou hast stricken me with blows and scourges. All we my sheep have gone astray, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all.
What have I done unto thee? Or wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. I did smite the kings of the Canaanites for thy sake, and thou hast smitten my head with a reed. He was he cut off out of the land of the living, for the, for the transgression, transgression of my people was he stricken. <laughs> Ever and ever. 